Okay, uh, <clears throat> so uh, first, uh, uh, a big thank you to uh, Sönke and Martin from Akasha who invited me here. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, digital content-based uh, identification today, um, uh, and especially uh, similarity hashing. And um, a little bit of background about me. I'm not from the scientific uh, background community, so I'm a little bit... Uh, um, uh, uh, I'm not part of this community, and I, uh, we are actually, it's the first time that we present this to, uh, to the scientific community, um, and I'm very eager to see uh, uh, what, uh, what you people think about this. I'm an entrepreneur with focus on media technologies, a founder and CEO of uh, Crafter Gear, a very small little company from Freiburg. We do um, ebook uh, production and distribution and trade publishing, and um, I'm also a techno creative software developer. Basically, I started from the business side, and I, I went more into the engineering side uh, <coughs> in the later years. And I'm also on, uh, the uh, one co-initiator of the Content Blockchain Project and uh, the ISCC, which is the, what we call the International Standard Content Code. So uh, I have a, a short history about uh, uh, where all this comes from. Um, the, the Things started with a project in 2016 where we got funding for, uh, for a project uh, to, uh, to check out what blockchain uh, and uh, this new uh, uh, environments and technologies will bring to journalism and uh, the content industry as a, as a whole. Uh, so so we, did, we did a one and a half year project and we had um, uh, quite some developers uh, um, hands on. So uh, this was basically uh, uh, the, the, the thing, the, the idea that we are moving, the internet is moving from a, 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 a basic uh, communication uh, or information sharing um, a platform to a, to a platform that, uh, where you can move value uh, natively. So um, what we uh, did there, it, it was quite extensive and very hands-on. So we, we just took what was out there uh, we have been looking at very different uh, blockchain uh, platforms that were available at then, that time, and uh, we are, were working uh, together with the journalists and, and people from that community and built prototyped uh, simple little applications. Like uh, we did a, a we, we launched a, a custom uh, small blockchain uh, based on, on Bitcoin source code. We built a, a wallet uh, and tried uh, to to do licensing stuff. We built some developer libraries. It's all a prototype. One thing that uh, came out of uh, all this research is the ISCC identifier, which I will be uh, talking uh, about today. So uh, the, the, the major outcome of uh, what we have been doing there and uh, while getting our hands dirty was uh, that uh, really the content community, so it's the larger, your scientists are basically part of this community, but the larger uh, um, uh, content community uh, should develop open standards and technologies and applications that establish content as the subject of transactions on blockchains. So basically the name of the project was Content Blockchain, and the first thing you have to tell the people, you won't put content on a blockchain because blockchain is really not the technology to put content there. So this is basically what we came up. This is the, the big view that we uh, uh, had at the end of the project, that uh, we have uh, uh, the blockchain uh, protocol layer services, which we currently actually see as public infrastructure, like what the internet gave us uh, in a different way um, to transfer, trustlessly transfer uh, value. Um, and what we need on that layer to make content, the content industry work, then uh, in this new environment, we will need new tools. And um, we have uh, some here, like problems that we want to solve is attribution, uh, smart licenses, and especially content uh, identification. And only above that comes uh, the, the new applications. So uh, we are uh, um, in between the infrastructure and the, the application layer with, uh, with these, uh, this stuff. So. Um, the thing is that we have been, of course, looking what is there if we want to have uh, content be what we talk about uh, in our transactions, uh, how do we reference content? So, of course, there are many content identifiers out there, but they re really, it turns out they're, they're not working. So you go on to Twitter, you find an image you want to use in your uh, journal or whatever. What's the identifier to reference this, uh, this image? 
So um, actually, the existing standard ad identifiers are basically, they are usually uh, centrally issued. So you, you have to you know, send a fax somewhere and register a number. They are often over-specialized in, in different communities. They are uh, curated uh, uh, by humans. Um, they have mostly no cryptographic features. They have high management costs, high barriers of entry, and they are really not made for the uh, blockchain world. And the goals of uh, the identifier that we've been working on uh, is uh, uh, our um, decentralized issuance. Basically, you don't have to issue them. Uh, they are generic uh, content identifiers, so they are not um, just for one sector uh, of content identification. They support algorithmic deduplication, proof of data possession, and they want to make uh, management costs and barriers, um, uh, lower barriers. And they are designed for the blockchain ecosystem. So decentralized content-based identification. The first thing that we need to understand, which many people really don't, uh, don't get, is that uh, if we are talking about a multi-sided uh, ecosystem, then anybody may have a legitimate interest to generate, look up, register, and identifier for some digital uh, content, because it's a means of communication. Um, so authorship or copyright should not be a requirement to get uh, an identifier. Um, the identifier might be used to communicate authorship and copyright, but it is not uh, a requirement to get an identifier. And um, the authoritative linking of identifier and content, what we call the binding between the two, can be done, of course, by algorithm. We know that. And um, so this is one precondition. You have seen this slide today uh, multiple si uh, uh, times. Hashing is, a, uh, is basically a very simple thing. So you take some arbitrary length data input, and uh, you put it into a function, and you get something of a fixed length, short, uh, which is deterministic. So every time you do it, you get the same if you put in the same data. Uh, and you cannot refer back to the data uh, from uh, the hash value that you created. This is the principle of all hash functions, but they are very, very different ones. So hash values are natural identifiers for data, widely used in IT systems like databases, file systems, version control systems, network protocols, in cryptography. So the benefits of hashing, there are, there are many. Um, they are used uh, for um, uh, verifying integrity of files, password protection, uh, protection for comparing files for equal equality, uh, generation of uh, pseudo-random bits, um, widely used in fail file and data identifiers like uh, JIT version control system, Mercurial IPFS is using them. And uh, actually, it's also used as a universal clock because proof of uh, work is based on that. So, but we also have non-cryptographic uh, hash functions, uh, which are like checksums, hash tables, um, used for data de deduplication and similarity measurement. So, and there's a very big difference because cryptographic hash functions are, um, um, they are uh, corre correlation resistant. So if you change anything in the data, uh, then the hash you get is not correlated to the hash you would get to the unchanged data. So that's uh, a feature of uh, cryptographic hash functions, but we also have hash functions that do quite the opposite. Uh, another point uh, that we went to is, uh, if you look at the identifier systems that are out there, um, uh, there's a lot of confusion about what is being identified. So we went into it uh, in a more you know, philosophical manner and, uh, and checked what can be identified in, in the area of digital content. And we found basically uh, six layers of uh, identification. So we, on, the, on the first, more, most abstract layer, we can identify any collection of uh, information. So it could be uh, a journal, uh, which we want to identify and all its issues. Then uh, we have a second layer, which is more concrete, where we uh, try to identify meaning. And this is a very interesting uh, part, because uh, in science, uh, we have made uh, major leaps in there. For example, um, we can uh, today uh, identify meaning by uh, machine learning uh, uh, systems. Uh, and we could have, for example, um, there are uh, cross-lingual uh, uh, sentence embeddings by now. So we can have an identifier for a sentence. Uh, and it would be the same for the sentence in different languages. So you have, let's say, 10 languages, and uh, that you, convey, you convey the same meaning in 10 different languages, but you can calculate the same identifier from, from it, or like the same vector. 
So this is what we uh, have at la layer two. On layer three, we uh, talk about a generic manif manif manifestation, which is basically, uh, um, uh, uh, a uh, let's assume you have a Word and a PDF document. Uh, you take out the plain text. The plain text is the generic manifestation. It's independent from any encoding format. It's uh, like a, a very uh, a clean and natural way of representing some data. Uh, you have that also for images, uh, where you have, in the end, you have pixels, which are coordinates, which you can respect in a quite uh, abstract, generic way. And then we have uh, media-specific manifestations, which are encodings, like you have a JPEG and you have a, 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 a PNG. And then we have uh, the exact, exact res representation, which is a bit-by-bit -bit similarity. And on the uh, individual copy uh, is basically what you have in the physical world. You have one specific book in your shelf, and you have some notes in there. And this is uh, what we call individual copy, which does not exist in the di di digital world, but which comes into play with the new blockchain-based technologies. So the ICC is a proposal for a modern and open content-based identification system. It is a, a universal uh, for uh, across uh, different types of media. Uh, these are the gener generic media types, text, image, audio, video. Um, it is a lightweight, multifaceted fingerprint designed for digitally encoded content. Uh, it is cross-sector applicable uh, for journalism, book, academic, publisher, music industry. And the goal is to establish content as a subject of transactions in decentralized and network environments again. So I guess I switched it off. Yeah, well, OK. <laughs> um, so it's designed for management of general and uh, granular and dynamic content. Um, uh, it supports content clustering, similarity de uh, detection, deduplication, and uh, it's de decentralized. So here is what it looks like. Uh, basically, uh, this uh, what you see here is uh, one ICC code, uh, and. Uh, you basically just drop in some information, a file, and what you get out is uh, this, uh, this code. And uh, it, the different uh, components can be used separately as identifiers, but they are very meaning more meaning meaningful if you use them together. And the first component is generated from metadata, very basic metadata, like a title of something. Uh, the content code is, is specific to the media type, so it's, uh, it's for text or image or audio. We have a data code uh, that is based on the raw uh, data, which is not decoded. And then we have the last component is basically part of a cryptographic hash. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, give a short demonstration. I hope this will work. Will it? Oh, OK. Uh, it should be public. Yeah. Okay, then we, I, I just tell you what, what you would see. <laughs> so basically, you have a, a JPEG image and a PNG image, which for us have the same content. For a machine, it's very different content because they are differently encoded. You drop it uh, on there, and you will get uh, two identifiers where uh, the first two components will be identical for the JPEG and the PNG, and the uh, last two components will be different. Uh, so we have the same here. Ah, maybe this one works. <laughs> yeah. So we do this here with a, an EPUB file and a PDF file. Um, so uh, you drop it. No. <laughs> so, uh, as you can see, it's created from uh, it's totally different files, uh, file formats, EPUB and PDF. So you have uh, basically, um, um, you can match them uh, just by the identifier uh, themselves. And even if these identifiers would come out different, you can measure the similarity between them because they are actually um, each of the components is 64 bits, and it's basically it's a 64-dimensional vector that places the syntactical structure of the content into a, a room of 64 dimensions. <laughs> so, 
Well, okay. So um, uh, I will. What does my time say? Okay. So uh, I will briefly go into the uh, into the separate components. So uh, the first uh, component is basically the most uh, abstract. It is generated, seeded from metadata. Now, because this is a, an, a universal identifier, we cannot say like you have to put in the author there, or uh, you know, we, do, we cannot put any requirements on the met metadata because, for example, who is the author of a movie? Yeah, well, it, it might be hard. Uh, who are the creators? So we basically just use the title and anything you want. It might be industry specific, but best you only use the title. And for scientific uh, usage, you could uh, BibTeX or something like that in a normalized form. You could put it in there. And we use this data to generate the most abstract uh, grouping part of the identifier. And, and you have uh, control over it, what you put there. And if you collide with some other regi uh, registered identifier, you just put in some more information and get a, a separate free identifier. Uh, and this uh, metadata is then frozen, so you can reproduce it. Uh, of course, metadata might change over time. This is a separate kind of metadata with you attached to the ISSC. So we distinguish be between seed metadata and floating metadata. So um, the, this is what we have been seeing there. So uh, the, the content identifier is, is media type specific. So you, you always identify image data or, or text data or video data or audio data. We also have a mixed version of it where you can take different uh, assets which are bundled in a, in a uh, multimedia document and create a, a compiled ISCC of mixed type. So the, uh, the, the thing is here that if you look at the data and you apply cryptographic hashing, they will be very different. And with the content ID, it, uh, it uh, will collapse to the same uh, based on the syntactical structural uh, content itself. And uh, we have this for text, we have this for image, and we uh, also ha have it already uh, about for audio, and, but it's still work in progress and for video. Then the data ID uses some uh, specific techniques for uh, measuring data similarity, which is, uh, which we, uh, is called content-defined chunking or shift-resistant chunking. So um, usually, um, if you, you cut data into pieces um, and then you put something somewhere, the, the cut points will all shift if you cut by a regular, regular um, um, amount of, uh, uh, of data. And uh, the content-defined ch chunking is a, is a trick to, to find these uh, cut points. And they are about some lengths, but not always exactly the same lengths. Uh, and they are, uh, the cut points are defined by their surrounding. So if you change some data here, all the other cut uh, parts of it stay the same. Um, uh, so it's used in deduplication de systems and, and stuff like this. So uh, we use this here uh, at the data similarity. And the last uh, one, which I told you is a cryptographic hash, is ba basically SHA-256, uh, double SHA-256 actually in a Merkle tree. This is, you know, all know this if you know uh, the Bitcoin block uh, structure. And we create a, a top hash, a Merkle root uh, from there, uh, which um, uh, we there take only the front part. If you really want a secure, provable uh, integrity, we also provide in the metadata the full 256-bit uh, hash. And the idea is here that you can give, I can give you an ISCC ID, I give you a part of my data, and I can prove that this data is part of what is identified by, by this. So it is proof of containment. So this is a, 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 an overview of the, the process, how the ISCC is created. It might look complicated, but actually, uh, I have coded this in 500 lines of Python code, so it's not that complicated. And uh, it's just functions, no classes, very, very simple, uh, uh, open source, available. Um, so um, it is not a kind of uh, content identification system like you have, uh, let's say, uh, YouTube's content ID. It's, uh, it's more like a lightweight fingerprint. But the idea to, to make a fingerprint like standardized and use it not as a fingerprint but as an identifier, I think is, uh, it's, it's an immensely powerful idea. Um, and um, I like to see this happen. So uh, just an example, uh, I, I've been looking at uh, the data uh, on 
unpay wall, they have 25 million records of uh, open uh, access uh, uh, titles uh, indexed by ISCC, uh, by, by DOI. And uh, I did some analysis on this, and it turned out, actually, there uh, uh, a, a DOI, -I, which you scientists all should know what it is. I don't have to explain it. Uh, it points to very different uh, documents, uh, which uh, mostly are uh, similar to each other, but not always uh, similar. So for this uh, DOI, -I, we have uh, four repositories where we can find open access uh, um, uh, versions. I have linked them here. Uh, and these are different versions, editions of, of about the same uh, document, but they are. And in the ICC, you can see they match up here. They mostly match up here, but not totally. And you can measure the similarity of the text between them just by comparing the identifiers. So the ICC codes actually create an emergent overlay structure uh, of content relations. And uh, uh, you can infer many things by comparing two ICCs uh, to, to each other. And um, to once again uh, show the difference, what we have currently is like uh, uh, random uh, UUIDs, uh, which are used in systems where we just produce some ID and there is no link between uh, the content. And there it always needs to be an authority who says, this is the file that belongs, or this is the data that belongs to this ID, but we have to believe them. The other one is uh, uh, SHA-256 uh, or other cryptographic hash functions, which are basically, uh, you don't have to trust anybody. It's very simple. You put in the data, you get the, the ID, which is very long, of course, to be secure. Um, but it's, uh, it's really secure. You cannot tamper with the data. You will always get uh, the same ID. But in content, we have changes. Dyna content is dynamic, and it changes. And we lose all the connection between the history of, of, uh, of some, some data if we only use cryptographic hashes. So the ISCC code comes up with a multifaceted fingerprint as an ISCC uh, that is generated from the content itself. And uh, then comes uh, the, the blockchain part where we can really, this is ugly and not for humans. And for citing, for example, we would like to have something short. We can have something this short that is resolved by a blockchain to the long. Uh, version, and um, we call this short code. This is in the making. It basically takes the components, uh, collapses them to this sh shorter variant, and in the header we say this is a short ID. Uh, it is registered on Bitcoin or block on whatever blockchain. So this would be a pointer to some blockchain, public blockchain. This is the date, uh, the part that clusters the data, and here we have a counter which we upcount to disambiguate uh, between uh, different uh, uh, things. So we have a completely decentralized uh, registry of uh, short, globally unique, persistence resolvable, owned, verifiable, and authenticated IDs, um, which could be even used for like uh, an URL shortener or whatever. Um, so, yeah. This is uh, what I'm working on. Actually, the, the dean, uh, uh, the German standardization organization, liked the idea, and they put it uh, up for proposal at the ISO to make an international standard out of it. Uh, we are at that, that sta stage, which is uh, stage two from about, I don't know, 49 steps through hell. Uh, and, um, uh, but I'm, I'm very grateful for this because this brings discussions uh, with, uh, with uh, the existing community of standard identifiers. Um, but it's, uh, it's a hard road. Well, um, so that's about it. Um, digital reality, there is too much uh, granular content to manually assign and track identifiers. Good news, all your uh, content already has an ISSC. It just needs to be extracted. Um, come join us. Uh, we have a, a, everything is uh, open source. And uh, of course, we are looking for contributors, donations, funding. Uh, currently, it's only funded by my passion. So. Thank you. So, uh, any questions? Yeah, uh, okay. I, uh, thank you very much, and thanks to Martin Welcome. for bringing you here. And this is like really interesting and really cool new stuff. And uh, okay, well, is it too cool and new, or are there other people working on similar things? Because we are like, you know, we have like we, we understand sort of what you're doing there, mm -hmm. but we don't have a, we don't have an overview in the field, right? Yeah. What's happening there? Yeah. Okay, so actually, it is absolutely yeah. not cool and absolutely not new, <laughs> uh, because all the technical technologies that are used here are widely known for okay, uh, yeah. more many many years. I think what's cool and new is the combination of using these technologies first in a standardized way, because this content. Uh, 
similarity, deduplication, matching, vectorizing stuff is used in, in many systems, but it's only used in closed systems and not, as a not for interoperability. And uh, I think this is the, the new part of it. Okay, cool. And um, so is there, is there any other questions? No? Okay. Um, I have one, one more, too. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, it's uh, really, really interesting, and uh, like I see, there is a lot of application of such thing. Um, and I'm just like wondering, like, what are technical limitations? And for example, if you have like you you compare two documents, like two P one PDF, one EPUB, like let's say there is like uh, a paragraph missing in one, uh, like could it lead into will it lead into dramatic change of hash or not? Uh, if you change a paragraph. It just completely remove one paragraph. Yeah. So uh, the thing is, that what we have there is uh, basically uh, it's estimated sim similarity that is encoded there by a technique called minhashing or whatever. The, the thing is, it always will depend on how m much percentage of the uh, document you, you change in relation uh, between them. So if you have one million paragraphs, or well, let's say 200 paragraphs, and you remove one, they will still be the same idea, ID, uh, or if you remove two paragraphs, they might start diverging, but you can still measure that they are close. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the sensitivity here is always based on uh, um, uh, relation to the whole data. So it is meant only for comparing uh, near, duplicate, uh, near duplicates. I see, yeah. So uh, from another perspective, if I will remove all articles, uh, like not articles, like let's say I will remove all, um, I don't know, like uh, the, uh, in, in the, in the document. Oh, we do that for you. Yeah? <laughs> no, we don't do that, but uh, if you, uh, yeah, that would uh, definitely um, uh, make it, make a difference then. So um, if you if you uh, remove uh, uh, large parts of the content, uh, it will, uh, you will find they, they don't it match up. So, and if like, uh, because uh, you also have like a, a meaning, you know, hash of a meaning, which is like very also interesting. Yeah, well, uh, you, you saw, the, you saw the, the layers I have been showing. Yeah. So uh, the second layers, like semantic meaning, uh, we don't have a component for that yet, uh, mm -hmm. but this would be something that we could do, which would be really uh, not sensitive to things like that, because if the meaning is the same, the ID would be still in the same space. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, you, you mentioned the media type, uh, the media dependent ID. So yeah. in, in case of the images, for example, you bring this to a standard image from Earth and then do it like a hashing or? Yeah, for uh, actually for the currently at the uh, syntactic level where we are with the content ID and not at the semantic level. At the syntactic level, yeah. we uh, take the image and we really just uh, make a very small version of it and then uh, ah. black and white it. And we, it's a perceptual hash, it's called. And we, okay. we measure the, the difference between one pixel to the next, eight by eight pixels. And this is gives us the... Uh, the, the, the fingerprint. How would you handle watermarks? Watermarks? We don't care. Okay. <laughs> That's also implemented. Uh, you can use it as... A w now, actually, there's some strange thing that we came up with in regards to watermarks. If you have a hash, a cryptographic hash, and you embed it into uh, uh, your document, then it will change. You cannot embed it in the document because you know embedding the hash will change the hash, which is a problem. So you cannot deliver the hash inside the file only separately. And now with uh, this one, uh, the, at least the first three parts, you can embed them, then recalculate it. You will get a little bit different one. Then you can embed that again recursively and. Eventually, you will find uh, an ISCC code that you can embed, which is the same that you get if you calculate it, which is a little bit weird, and I'm not sure what the use case of it, but I guess watermarking could be one of the use cases where this comes in. Or are you talking about visible wa watermarks? Well, I don't mind so much. I'm just thinking about retractions of articles, which are normally still there, but watermarked as retraction. Uh, uh, excuse me? If you retract an article, yeah. then normally it's still there, but it will have the watermark, this article is retracted. Okay. I'm, I, I'm sorry, I can't follow you. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, and I think so, uh, like so. This, I mean, exactly this is what what's fantastic is that we have we have to look in other fields, and then like and then uh, look at the application. This is what we we should call serendipity, basically, right? Yeah. Like what we did with your talk. Other talks were also great, but this is great because of the transfer. Of yeah, the, I'm of, I'm, of, I'm yeah. totally yeah. not from the scientific yeah. background, so uh, I'm yeah, volatile. Or, or, or science communication yeah. culture or something. Yeah? yeah, but this is exactly what makes it valuable. Sometimes you like to do this. Yeah. Okay. There are like one or two more questions. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I just have one question. Can I use your model to detect deep fake models, where I can use a, uh, uh, like a GANs or deep learning to fake the faces and uh, and the and the images, or not? Yeah, because you can hash the photos and you can copy paste or or you can change something in it. So. It yeah, well, I, I, I guess that uh, uh, because we are, are using like um, uh, dimensionally di dimension re reduction technologies in the different components, uh, actually these are viable inputs uh, for machine uh, and deep learning uh, tasks. So basically, you could, for example, use the identifiers and try to learn, uh, for example, which language the text is written in just by looking at the identifier. Of course, these are all information which uh, go into the area of, uh, you know, probabilistic uh, um, uh, information. So you you don't have guaranteed information, but you can do statistics with it and use it for machine learning. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just to ask, um, do you also distinguish um, the gravity of changes? Let's say, just a very simple example: you have essentially the same text, but one author would come to the conclusion this is true. And the other one says it's not true. So, so like, like uh, from the wording, in in the extreme case, you would only have one added word, right? But you would have a completely different statement of the thing, which is uh, would would that rate at the same thing as a, a word like well or so that you put in, which doesn't mean much. In uh, or if if for example a mathematician has a calculation, and let's say in the simplest case, you have the result 42. And it would matter if somebody else had 43. Would that just count as a single digit, kind of potentially erroneously done? Or can you say, OK, this is a, a, a major deviation in the scientific statement? Or you just rank that as a typo or grammatical error or very minor deviation? Well, you are already on the semantic level, which we didn't uh, implement yet. So uh, um, currently, it's really just a syntactical similarity that we have on the content ID. Basically, what we do is we delete all the space, uh, we do uh, uh, normalize all the text, we go in 13 character bunches, we go through it, and we create uh, 128 different hashes over it. And it's really just structural similarity. So there is no, no semantic stuff there. If we do the semantic ID, I guess uh, I have to stop now. We can we can talk uh, uh, separately. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you very much. And it is like